I'm Blake Hargreaves. Welcome to Future Stops. You're hearing the sounds of the Juge Sinclair Organ Builders Workshop, an unassuming factory on historic Mill Street in Montreal. This season on Future Stops, we're exploring the craft of organ building by profiling some of the companies and artisans carrying the tradition into the 21st century. For episode two of our Canadian Organ Builders series, we visit the workshop of Juge Sinclair. Inside their Montreal factory, three huge rooms with ceilings about four stories high contain everything needed to build a pipe organ, including the space to assemble and test it, and the entire 12-person team of builders. Alex Ross is a technical designer here, but did not start out that way. I started as an organist and then eventually got a summer job here and then that turned into an apprenticeship and then that turned into a full-time job. Um, I do a lot of the technical design and also I'm pretty implicated in the voicing of the organs as well. Um, But in a small shop like this everybody does a bit of everything so sometimes I might be making keyboards or wind chests or wooden pipes. Um, I learned virtually everything here on the job, so I had a basic understanding of how the organ worked from um, being an organist, and I went to university for organ performance, and other than that, like all the, the carpentry and the design and voicing and everything that was, I learned here. So there's, there's no school for organ building. There was one uh, college that did it in the United States, but that program uh, got shut down one or two years ago. And I think there generally are schools in Germany, but otherwise in North America, there's nothing you learn on the job. And what can you tell us about the history of this company? This company is still relatively recent. Um, it's uh, Some companies really hit the ground running. Uh, Juge Sinclair really started in small organs, practice organs and continual organs, and gradually sort of worked our way up. Around the time that I entered the company was when uh, Opus 42 was being built for Christ the King in Dallas, which I suppose you could kind of say was um, JS's break into the big leagues. And so ever since that instrument, which is still our largest to date um, for at least another year, then we really started getting asked more and more by bigger churches about bigger organs. Um, I think what's pretty special about our company compared to a lot of other companies is that we really try and make as much of the instrument we can ourselves. We subcontract very little, only if it's something really specialized that we can't make ourselves, like the combination action would be pretty intense for us to make because none of us have a, a technical training in electronics um, to that level. Um, but all the little mechanical action parts, like nearly all of it, we, we make ourselves. And so we know our instruments inside and out. Um, they're about as custom as you can get. Um, tonally, we're pretty flexible, I would say. That being said, we're We're pretty known for uh, French symphonic-based eclectic instruments at this point, and because a lot of our organs out there lately have been in that style, that's what people know us for, and so that's what people generally ask us for. But um, looking back a little further, it's a little more of your um, organ movement, um, Germanic-based classical eclecticism. Um, There's a fantastic... Uh, authentic classical replica of a, a 18th century French organ in a museum in Quebec City. Um, and then some of the other organs that we've done, like the, the biggest one, Opus 42, are pretty heavily leaning towards the symphonic side of things. Um, but we have a pretty strong French connection um, because of the language, because of the the culture, the media that we're exposed to, as well as um, Montreal's own organ culture. Montreal's organ culture includes six different factories within an hour's drive. Each one purveyors of a unique sound, culture, and history. As they move into the 21st century, so many new technologies have become available to enhance the working of these complex instruments. It's a challenge to choose which ones to integrate 
into a craft steeped in hundreds of years of French Canadian tradition. That's one of the uh, the things that I absolutely love about this job is that we're we're always trying to reconcile those to find the the best aspects of of both sides of the equation. Um, so we love our combination actions when we're playing, but lately we've been using a lot of carbon fiber trackers uh, because they're they're lighter than wood. They're they're more resilient. Um, they offer a lot of advantages actually over wood in certain applications anyway. But at the same time, like ultimately when you get to the pipes, it's the same technology as it has been for thousands of years. There's there's nothing new in the pipes. Um, you kind of see this dichotomy, this dichotomy reflected in the shop itself. Um, some people will have um, fancy new hand tools that they've bought or um, some new machines that we have. We have a CNC lathe that we can uh, program it to cut out pieces via the computer. But everybody still also, nearly everybody in the shop has a pretty avid interest in uh, collecting antique hand tools as well, which we use. So when you walk around the shop, you can see everybody has bench planes and chisels and, and rasps and whatnot. How does JS fit into the Quebec organ making tradition? It's, um, it's kind of interesting uh, how we fit in, in a way. Um, Kezavan, for example, is the big fish in the pond, as we all know, and they've been around for over 120 years at this point, I believe. And so they have their own traditions which have brought them to where they are now. A lot of our history, where the founding partners came from, are um, more through the organ reform movement. Casavant brought over Helmut Wolf and Karl Wilhelm, who eventually opened their own shops that were very organ reform. And then from there, Denis Juget enters the equation, and then Steve Sinclair started with Helmut. And so we sort of see this long Quebec tradition with fresher, newer eyes, I suppose. Though we're still interested to see exactly how it evolves. And so we've done plenty of restorations of 19th century organs around Quebec, um, there's currently some research being done by on Louis Mitchell by Robin over here. So it's, um, I think it gives us a more unbiased view because we're not directly tied to, um, at least to organ building tradition before like the 80s in Montreal. So. Can you talk to me a bit about this project that's currently sitting on the shop floor? Sure. The, the organ that we can see in front of us here is the second of three organs for the Cathedral of the Sacred Heart in Richmond, Virginia. They ordered an extra small, so a little continual organ of three and a half stops, a medium, which is 25 stops here in front of us, and then an extra, extra large, which is, I think, 58 stops. Um, and that one is just starting production now. It'll be done in two years. This organ is meant as a choir organ. It goes at the front of the cathedral, sort of hidden off to the side. It's insanely compact. It, uh, it has to do quite a lot in very, very limited space. So it actually has a tunnel running through the bottom uh, 11 feet of it because it, it goes right in the processional route, in the ambulatory of the cathedral. So you have to be able to process underneath the organ, essentially, and then all of the, the blower, the bellows, the pipes, a lot of the action, it's way up, um, starting at like the 12 foot mark. Was it challenging to design this organ to fit in with the aesthetic of the church? Compact organs are immensely difficult to design um, the hardest thing about it is you have to keep 40 things in your head all at the same time. Um, you have to remember essentially all the obstacles while you're drawing. There are layers upon layers upon layers of, of things that you've drawn, be it wind systems or wind chests or pipes. They're all on different layers which you can turn on and off. When they're all on, it's impossible to tell what's going on. It's just too busy. So you have to work with only a few layers on at a time, but then you have to remember everything else that you've already drawn so that you don't um, have trackers that have to uh, pass through the bellows, for example. So it's um, when you get in the zone and, and you have everything in your head at once, it's actually difficult to stop drawing because um, 
you kind of you become hyper aware of like what am I going to lose in my short term memory if I go have a coffee now like I'm going to forget about this crucial thing and so it's, it's some and sometimes you have to find really really creative solutions um, to problems so for example the fact that we were able to fit the entire wind system the action the bottom of the wind chests and everything in in a height of like two and a half feet is really really quite something but still like we were kind of some creative solutions we have here is the 16 foot subas is laying horizontally on top of the swell box it's actually the highest stop in the whole organ um but sometimes you you just can't win so if you see a photo of the organ which i'm sure one will get posted on the on the website or something but uh there's a little wind trunk that pops out the side it'll be kind of the organs kind of pushed up against the wall so it's not really going to be that visible unless you go looking for it so it's stained the same as the case but there's this little wind trunk that pops out the side of the case and runs up to a higher level because there's just simply no way to have that inside the organ without like passing through the wind chest which you just can't do so and there's that's just got air ch- going through it exactly it um it feeds there's an offset eight foot bourdon base for the grand org which is mounted up higher on the wall on the inside of the case but there's just no other way to actually get the wind there than this wind trunk that jumps outside of the organ and then right back inside um, two meters higher when you deviate from the typical layout of a pipe organ um, does it affect the sound it certainly can um, I guess th- depending on what school of organ building you're looking at there may not be a typical layout for organ reform sort of classical style organs there are sort of established formulas in this case um, because it just has to be as compact as possible that all kind of goes out the window and so here we have the grand org pedal sort of in front and then the racy is behind it and and you hear that in the sound i mean the race c sounds like it's further away because it has to speak through the grand org but that's just uh, sort of the reality of the the constraints that we were given um some things are are really difficult to tell in the shop how it'll be in the church so for example behind the race c um in about a foot of space between the back of the swell box and the wall of the church there's a 16 foot trombone and it sounds fantastic in here but but we're waiting to see in the church is that trombone going to be amplified by the the walls and ceiling of the church or is it going to be muffled and eaten up so there's some things you just can't predict there are some things you can't get around and what about the look of this organ fitting into the look of the church was that a challenge it sort of was the mandate for the choir organ here was to sort of just disappear um, the clergy didn't want it distracting too much attention from what was going on in the chancel itself so it sort of it lives under an arch the chancel is apsidal there's an ambulatory aisle that runs in a semicircle around the back of the chancel and there's a, a bunch of columns and arches that will uh, that separate those two and so the organ the main facade just kind of fits nicely into one of the arches looking in from the side so you really can't see the organ when you're sitting out in the church it's only when you're in the chancel that you'll be able to see the console the woodwork is is all stained very dark so it, it disappears and otherwise it's pretty plain looking it there's nothing too fancy in the decoration so just enough that it doesn't stick out because it's too boring but not enough that it says hello there's an organ here that is a job that's reserved for the gallery organ which is the one coming up in two years that it it, it'll be quite fancy and big and meant to attract attention before the next project can start the current choir organ needs to be completed and during our visit this instrument is set up and meticulously inspected millimeter by millimeter You can see photos and videos of our visit at the Future Stops website. Steve Sinclair, who used to work in the Helmuth Wolf workshop, joined Juget in 1998. He's in the process of adjusting the action of the swell-to-great coupler on this organ with the help of a technician. Okay, c'est beau. Ça, c'est très loin. So I'm adjusting uh, couplers, the um, 
the Racy Octave Coupler, 16 foot coupler. And what we're doing is just bringing um, the Racy so it speaks just after the ground organ. Yep. Um, and I have to test them. You can see separately, I'll play the notes separately. So that's the ground org, and that's the Racy. We take them at a different, in a different octave while we're adjusting them so we can hear the difference. And we play the coupler very carefully and hear how long afterwards the race he comes compared to the ground org. Donc c'est trop loin. Rapproche-le. And we just... Là c'est un, un peu trop proche. We don't want them exactly at the same time because then the two pluck, the pluck of the ground org will be on top of the, uh, or the pluck of the race will be on top of the pluck of the ground org. C'est toujours trop proche. So we want to just back it off so the racy is just slightly late and that way the two c'est beau. That way the two plucks aren't on, on top of each other. You just uh, you just go through the pluck on the ground organ and your finger just falls straight through the racy. When you play them they sound simultaneous. Rapproche. Uh, we just have to go through every note that uh, that same way. Oui, rapproche encore. C'est beau. You have to... You have to play in a... special way on the keyboard to adjust like this to make them... If, if you just play normally, you can't tell what's going on, but if you make your finger very rigid, you can get it to play halfway like that. Rapproche.
You're listening to the Future Stops podcast, an initiative of the Royal Canadian College of Organists. My name is Blake Hargreaves, and I'm your host as we explore the world of the 21st century organ. We just heard today's feature piece, Preladium Circulaire, the first movement of Charles Marie Vidor's Organ Symphony No. 2 in D major, played by Jason Alden on Juge Sinclair's Opus 42 at Christ the King Catholic Church in Dallas, Texas. While the choir organ set up in the workshop now is nearly complete, its much larger counterpart, the great organ, is just getting started. The process of building a larger instrument is much the same, but with a complex craft like organ building, every project presents challenges. In this case, the great organ's wooden pipes, which necessitate a lot more care and planning. It's in the pretty uh, early days still, so the main focus is to get the choir organ out the door in a month, but the pipe makers have been busy. I think they've made about 20 uh, metal stops already. Um, Many of the cabinet makers have moved on to making wooden pipes. The design is underway. Nothing yet that resembles an organ, but... uh, What are the different challenges um, comparing the manufacture of metal pipes and wooden pipes? Well, they're two completely different skills. The metal pipe makers, for the most part, are actually a little separate from the rest of the shop. When I say most people can do a bit of everything, that's that's true except for the, uh, the, the difference between the metal pipe making and sort of everything else. I think there are only two people that can kind of jump back and forth between metal pipes and, and the rest of organ building. Um, learning to solder is is something that you, you just can't put it into words. You just have to do it a thousand times until you get the feeling in your bones, I guess. I don't do a lot of it myself, but it's it's a really hard to acquire skill that takes a lot of practice to master. And so they really focus on that. And wooden pipes, on the other hand, it's... Um, yeah, it's it's basic carpentry to actually make them. The big difference in the challenges is actually, I would say, in the voicing. The metal pipes have so many different parameters that you can change back and forth, and a few that you can't take back. Once you raise the mouth, you can't bring it back down. But you can pull the lip out, push it in, pull it out, push it in, pretty much as many times as you want. Whereas most of the voicing, in air quotes, for the wooden pipes happens in the design. Um, For the most part, the voice of the wooden pipe happens uh, when you design it, and the pipe is sort of going to give what it can give. There are very few parameters that you can change once the pipe is actually built, so um, we have to be more careful when we're designing wooden pipes because we, we have a hard time reacting afterwards if it's not exactly the sound that we wanted. It's so rare nowadays to find a workshop in an industrial area so close to the historic center of a big city, and even more rare to find tools and methods from centuries ago being used in that workshop as they always have been. If you visit our website and social media, you'll see the unique open concept layout of this space where every member of the team works together, shares tasks, and eats at the same table. These unique features of the Juge Sinclair Organ Builders Workshop are inspiring and remind us of the incredible quantity of human effort and tradition that goes into a single rank on an organ that might contain over a hundred. We'd like to thank the team at Juge Sinclair for inviting us into their workshop. We'd like to invite you to enter our world by joining us on social media at Future Stops and Future Stops Podcast, where you can explore photos and videos of Juge Sinclair's incredible space and bring your voice to the conversation. Future Stops is a podcast from the Royal Canadian College of Organists, produced by Andrew O'Connor with Sanjay Parker as Community Manager and Executive Producer Elizabeth Shannon. I'm your host, Blake Hargreaves.